we don't see any inter-imperialist conflict. The material realities of the world demonstrate that one bloc, the, the actual military bloc, intelligence bloc, political bloc, the bloc of the global north, is exercising uh, extraordinary extra economic force on the world. And the global south is operating in a curious way where large countries, Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, China, Russia, and so on, uh, are basically in, a, you know, in an interesting new mood. That's the phrase that we use. But also, China and Russia are not aggressive powers. They are defensive powers. They are defending their borders. And in that case, we have shown materially through this analysis that the argument of multi, multiple imperialisms is specious. Hello and welcome to the No Cold War Britain podcast. I'm Ileana Chan and my co-host is Fiona Edwards. This podcast aims to bring you in-depth discussions every month on the key issue of our time, stopping the U.S. new Cold War offensive and Britain's role in this major threat to world peace and prosperity. Every month, we bring you a key voice from Britain or international to delve deeper into why this new Cold War is happening, what dangers it presents, and how we can build a movement to stop it. We are really honored that joining the show today is Vijay Prashad. Vijay is an Indian historian, author, journalist, and political commentator. He is the executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, editor of Leftward Books, chief correspondent at Globe Trotter, and a senior non-resident fellow at Chongyang Institute for, for Financial Studies in China. His writings focus on the global South and the struggle against imperialism. Wow, that was a mouthful. That's a very long list of accolades. BJ, welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and congratulations for doing this podcast. It's great. You know, any, any way we can get people to think about these issues is terrific so well played well um on that on that topic vj when we're in a massive battle of ideas at the moment with what's happening in the world we've got these massive uh threats to world peace and also to like a livable planet in terms of climate breakdown and we're really excited to have you on the show because very recently um the tricontinental institute which you direct and an organization called Global South Insights have teamed up together to produce a new publication, which is called Hyperimperialism, A Dangerous Decadent New Stage. It's out and available now. You can download it in many different languages on the Tricontinental website. So um, Fiji, I wanted to ask you because you describe this um, hyperimperialism study as a landmark study. And you also say it's like the most significant theoretical statement that the Tricontinental Institute has made in its eight-year history, which is you know, quite a big thing to say since, of all, since there's so much amazing work that your institute puts out. So could you explain to us why this new study is so important and explain to our listeners what exactly is hyperimperialism? So firstly, um, you, Fiona, were one of the first people, I think, to read the whole study because you reviewed it in Morning Star, for which we are grateful. It's always great to have a review right off um, you know, from the gate. So that's great. And I very much hope Others will read it. It's 186 pages. So it's difficult to summarize all of it. Let's start at an obvious place. You know, after the entry of Russian troops into Ukraine, um, there was a lot of pressure on countries of the global south to condemn Russia, a lot of pressure. And, you know, there was this sort of um, attitude that, well, if the United States says that you should condemn Russia or if Brussels says, NATO says you should condemn Russia, you must. And countries just didn't, including India, you know, which is run by a government of the right, um, didn't condemn Russia. In fact, the foreign minister, uh, S. Jay Shankar, was pretty forthright, saying, you know, we don't need to do what you tell us. People like Naledi Pandor of South Africa use a term like bullying, don't bully us. A couple of years ago, therefore, I was quite surprised uh, to watch a press conference at the Japanese foreign ministry, where the Japanese foreign ministry spokesperson was asked pretty, I think, um, you know, without any kind of agenda, was asked, how do you define the global south? Because all these countries are not, you know, getting in line. And the spokesperson, she paused and she said, I think, pretty honestly, we don't have any idea what the global south is. 
And I think she said pretty sincerely, we think it's the developing countries, but we really don't know. And, you know, subsequent to that, Japan every year produces a big blue book, which is their understanding of the situation in the world. In the very, you know, comprehensive blue book, subsequent to this interaction, there's a section on the global south. But my God, when you look at that section, it's weak. You know, they really don't know what's going on. And part of our, I think, our desire to enter this topic um, was to basically try to define what is the global north? What is the global south? I haven't seen a real definition of these two concepts. I used them. I've used them for, you know, 10, 12, maybe 15 years. Um, but I've never really bothered to define these terms. It seemed ipso facto, um, you know, self-evident to me, right? But we took the time and we looked at all the 190 countries in the world. We spent a lot of time uh, writing things on, on, you know, on, on boards and on chart paper. You know, what's the relationship with between Australia, New Zealand and the United States? Is there a difference between the UK and the US? And, and so on. And, and we basically plotted out, mapped out the linkages and connections. And what we found was quite significant. What we found was that over the course of the past, let's say, 100 years, but at least since the end of the Second World War, a block has consolidated, which we can call the Global North. That's a real block. And there are institutional mechanisms that keep that block together. So I'll just quickly mention three of the institutional mechanisms. One of them is a political mechanism created in 1974, and that's the G7, the group of seven. Now, obviously, there was a political mechanism prior to the G7. Um, you know, there were informal consultations. There was the so-called trilateral commission. You know, lots of different bilateral things, United States in connection with, with European countries and so on. But the G7 is an annual meeting of the leaders of the seven uh, most important countries of the global north, the United States, Canada, um, United Kingdom, France, West Germany initially, now Germany, Italy, and Japan. That's the seven. Um, so the G7 is a kind of political arm of the global north. Then, much earlier than the G7's formation in 1949, was the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization which brings together North America, mainly the United States and Canada, not, not Mexico. It's very unfair to say North America because you forget that technically Mexico is part of North America. But United States, Canada, Europe, and now the non-European country, which is the UK, um, into a military alliance. Again, there are some differences. France is not exactly the same kind of NATO member as, say, Germany. Uh, but... The defeated powers, Italy and Germany, basically opened up their territory to U.S. military bases. And NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, becomes the structure for a military pact, which since um, the collapse of the USSR in 1991, has had a global footprint. You know, it's uh, after 1991, NATO operated in Afghanistan. In 2001 onward, NATO has operated in Libya, and then NATO has operated in the South China Sea. Now, again, uh, NATO officials will say, will demur and say, well, not exactly. We didn't exactly operate in the South China Sea as NATO. But in, in fact, if you read the NATO documents and listen to them at the NATO summit, they think of themselves as global NATO. So that's a military pact. And third, something often ignored by people and shouldn't be ignored is the in fact, integration of these powers into an intelligence system started as the Five Eyes system. Um, that was the, mainly the settler colonial countries, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom with United States, you know, the English speaking old settler colonial countries. Um, but now it's the 14 eyes and it includes, you know, in a very important way, Israel. And these countries share intelligence, but also share new technologies for surveillance, um, including forms of digital surveillance and so on. So the Global North operates in a unified way. And we looked at military spending and found that this Global North is responsible for three quarters of the share of global military spending. 
that is extraordinary you know it is a very small population of the world responsible for three quarters of the world military spending the global south on the other hand has some kinds of groupings but it's not a block um there are some unities and we did these around rings there are some you know most countries seeking sovereignty there are countries that are sort of newly non aligned you know maybe turkey is even though a nato country is bristling under the weight of nato in malaysia you know recently anwar ibrahim prime minister of malaysia slapped olaf schulz in a press conference when mr schulz said hey listen we support israel and anwar ibrahim you know drove a truck through the brainlessness of olaf schulz moral incapacity of the german leader it was amazing um, to watch but the south is not a block and southern military spending is limited there is no intelligence you know a sharing and so on so the outcome of this coming directly to your last question uh, on this fiona is that we don't see any inter imperialist conflict the material realities of the world demonstrate that one block the the actual military block intelligence block political block the block of the global north is exercising a uh, extraordinary extra economic force on the world and the global south is operating in a curious way where large countries brazil india indonesia south africa china russia and so on uh, are basically in a you know in an interesting new mood that's the phrase that we use but also China and Russia are not aggressive powers they are defensive powers they are defending their borders and in that case we have shown materially through this analysis that the argument of multi multiple imperialisms is specious there is no material basis it's a moral statement made by people it's not there's no material basis for believing there's a russian imperialism or a chinese imperialism those are defensive powers um but also and here's the last point um it's important to recognize that we use the term hyper imperialism to show the kind of kinetic character of it it's it's you know it's what an old cia station chief in tehran and then paris told me chuck cogan years ago he said if you have a big enough hammer everything looks like a nail and in a sense that's the kinetic aspect of hyper imperialism the first thing you do you don't need to talk is to confront somebody to be aggressive you know sanctions war and so on so that's why hyper imperialism is not what karl kautsky talked about as ultra imperialism where the differences in the elites around the world is flattened that's not that's not at all what we're talking about we're talking about this singular imperialist pole which is operating in a kind of nutty madman sort of way thank you for that um you kind of mentioned this a little bit you you were kind of talking about this the huge discrepancy and really the damning um this uh, dossier shows the damning scale of the US military spending and you kind of you kind of talked about that with um interimperialist rivalry so called can you like talk a little bit more though about like the actual figures or the data especially in terms of the US and and Russia and China Yeah so it's important to acknowledge that we have previously relied on a institute based in Stockholm Sweden called SIPRI which is you know the 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 carrier of military spending around the world i mean everybody from people on the right to the people on the left have relied on SIPRI numbers now when you look actually into particularly us military spending it's highly deflated in the SIPRI numbers um let me give you a simple example two of them for real incredible deflation so what is the cost of a military a military is um all is the troops as well as the hardware you know both things count well what happens when you send a young person into a combat zone and they are injured what happens to their medical bills uh, subsequent to the injury you know should that count as part of military spending or is that social spending uh, it's a good question to ask it's actually a a question about how one understands militarism in a society you know um because you can say well healthcare spending has nothing to do with the military but it does if you're treating long term mental health problems and physical problems of your troops who have, who have been in battlefield situations overseas so there's that often left out and then actually the most significant thing is 
if you just take the us government's defense spending what they call defense military spending it's a number it's a big number it's not a small number it's in the you know close to a trillion us dollars that's a big number okay by itself but you know that the united states is not merely a land army a sea army and an air army it's also a nuclear power so where's the nuclear spending like where's the money for the nuclear weapons well a lot of that is in the department of energy budget not in the defense department budget so you got to go and peel out from their energy department numbers you got to look deeper you know at the actual spending in the budget toward the military and and our analysts uh, scoured uh, the us own documents it's not that we're you know looking for some leaks these are public documents and we built a a number which is in fact much larger than the near trillion it's in fact a trillion and a half uh, and 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 rising so if you see a rise in by this calculation a rise in us military spending it changes all the percentages because now global military spending is higher and even though global military spending by volume is higher i'm sorry to sound so nerdy on all this um the percentage of us military spending rises consequent you know as a as a consequence um so you know i said 75% thereabouts is nato plus the bulk of that is the united states and china is interesting because you think oh my god the chinese have a giant military you know look at the news headlines china is going to take over colonizing africa or china is threatening this or threatening that threatening what with what um global share of military spending roughly 12% as opposed to 75% but that's also an interesting number because despite enormous advantage uh, uh, despite enormous advances in chinese military technology a large part of china's military spending is for the army it has a very large army um and that army is used for all kinds of things including like like the us military it's used for search and rescue disaster management so is the us military it's not the case that the us doesn't do this you know if there's a a flood the military goes in um you know that's a fair use of 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 people who are hired by the state and trained to do certain things it's a fair use but there's a huge salary burden in there so in fact like the chinese don't have multiple aircraft carriers um the chinese don't have 920 military bases like the united states has and so on that's where the that's where the budget that's where the money goes you know it's the money goes for the us in very sophisticated uh, weaponry it has really some of the most sophisticated weaponry but also because the united states is look let's face it so far away from the rest of the world yeah um it's an island in a way it's only close to south america but otherwise there's the atlantic the pacific it costs a lot of money for the united states to have a global footprint which means maintaining the bases maintaining multiple uh, you know aircraft carrier groups uh, maintaining an enormous submarine fleet and so on uh, that costs money and that the chinese don't have they don't have this global footprint they have as i said a footprint to defend what they consider the chinese homeland that's really the basis of their military posture similarly with the russians um it's true russia has a um a naval base in latakia in syria but there's a reason for that i mean you know anybody who looks at maps will realize that almost all russian ports freeze over uh well with climate change that might change but they freeze over for most of the year you know they are not warm water ports they are not um you know perennial ports they are summer ports and which means that the russian navy uh is 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 is, is spends its winters in two different ports and it's interesting because both of these became hot spots in the last decade one is the port of latakia or tartus in syria um and hence the russians intervened militarily in 2015 in the conflict um in syria sent in aircraft and so on protecting its port let's be quite honest it wasn't a big humanitarian gesture and the second is the port in sevastopol in crimea um where there was the hot spot around the maidan in in 2014 so between 2014 2015 russia almost lost both its 
warm water ports, access to its warm water ports. Um, those are defensive interventions, in my opinion, not aggressive ones. Um, now, you can say the Wagner Group is aggressive and so on. That you know is a is a good discussion topic. Um, yes, they are certainly aggressive. They're a mercenary force and and whatnot. But it's difficult to compare the U.S. military interventions globally, the massive aggressive military exercises that take place, say, at the borderline on the waters of the People's Democratic Republic of Korea or off the coast of Venezuela. I mean, these are aggressive, enormous naval exercises. You don't see that happening from these other countries. So it's really, it's not even a question of apples and oranges. You know, that's that's a wrong thing. It's It's like we're talking about two different planets here, you know. Um, you know, I mean, it's like fruits and veg, not two different kinds of fruit. Oh, brilliant, Vijay. That's, you know, that's a really, um, really interesting explanation of everything. And just want to kind of develop this a little bit, actually, because you've written um, that the bottom line when it comes to understanding hyperimperialism is that there is one world system that is managed dangerously by an imperialist bloc, which you've explained quite clearly um, so far. And the case is put forward that China and Russia aren't imperialist and that therefore the US isn't in an inter-imperialist rivalry. Because I think you were referring before to, you know, World War One, World War II, there was an inter-imperialist rivalry with, you know, you know, major major war against the Nazis, for example. Whereas there are some people though on the Western left, progressive forces that think China and Russia are imperialist. So they say, well, what's going on in the world today? We might be heading to a third world war and it's, you know, the West versus Russia and China. And that's a Hi, um, that, that's an inter-imperialist rivalry. What would you say to Western leftists and progressive forces that adopt that idea? Well, there's two things. One is, I think, a basic category error. A country can be aggressive, but that doesn't make it imperialist. You know, there are many instances of one country invading another. Um, right now, um, Rwandan forces are in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the eastern flank. Well, they claim it's not their forces, the M23 rebel group, but they're using all kinds of Rwandan equipment and so on. Um, Rwanda is not an imperialist power. It's, an, it's being aggressive in that part of the world. Um, when, for instance, India entered East Pakistan in 1971 and therefore participated in the liberation of Bangladesh, that was an aggressive move, no doubt about that. Military crossed the border. Um, you know, when the Vietnamese army crosses into Cambodia to end the killing fields of the Khmer Rouge, that was an aggressive move. The Vietnamese aggressively crossed into another country, but there's a reason they did it, to stop the genocide taking place inside Cambodia, or in the case of Bangladesh, uh, to stop the massacre of the, of the people, the Bengali people who become Bangladeshi. You know, um, these are aggressive moves, but all aggressive moves aren't bad. Look at the examples I gave you. Was it wrong for the Vietnamese army to cross into Cambodia? I don't think so. I, I applaud them for doing that. Um, was it wrong for for the Egyptian army um, to attempt several times to defend the Palestinians in the 50s and to some extent in the 60s? Now, of course, they are sitting on their hands, doing nothing, wasting their training and wasting their equipment. Um, you know, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. So there is aggressive. Russia's entry into Ukraine is an act of aggression, but it's not imperialist. And I'll explain that in a minute. But I, I don't want to allow this category, you know, error to go un, uh, uncommented upon because it is an error people make, you know, people are morally outraged. I'm outraged that the Russian army has violated the sovereignty of Ukraine. Okay, let's have a conversation about that. I would accept that that was an aggressive move. They aggressively crossed the border. They sent the tanks and planes and so on, but it's not imperialist. And, and I'll come back to why that is. So first I would, I would, it's not an act of peace to send tanks into another country. It's an aggressive move. It's not imperialist. And that difference is important. So to understand, I think, imperialism, it's a good idea to periodize these things. Um, and I, I'll offer just a couple of, of periods to, to explain what I mean. You know, when, when World War, well, he didn't know it was World War I, when the Great War broke out in 1914 um, and the social democratic parties in Europe, the left parties, um, participated in, in, in the warmongering, you know, in Germany, the great social democratic party voted for war credits and so on. Lenin was exasperated. So was Rosa Luxemburg. 
they were exasperated. They were on the left side of, of that movement. And so Lenin then sits down and says, well, why? What has happened? What has, what, what has brought forth this great war? You know, what is the reason? And he then reads John Hobson, the great English liberal who wrote about imperialism. And he reads a lot of books and pamphlets and magazines, over 100 books and pamphlets he read in this period. And he comes up, jots down his thoughts in a pamphlet. It's not a very large book, which is written in 1916 called Imperialism. What does Lenin argue? Lenin argues that capitalism, um, which has a tendency uh, through competition to create monopolies. You don't have to have monopolies created. It has a tendency to create monopolies. These near monopolies uh, develop within territories, within nations. So there will be monopolies in Britain and monopolies in, in Germany and so on. That's why I call them more near monopolies because it's not a global monopoly. It's a near monopoly. Monopoly in a territory, maybe. Well, because they have a proximate and intimate relationship with the political elites, um, they push the political elite to help them get a decisive advantage in world markets. Um, that's called mercantilism. And as political elites helping their, their companies, their multinational or their monopolies, um, get a footprint elsewhere in the world, perhaps in the, in the, in the colonies or even in each other's markets, that leads to tensions and clashes and an inter-capitalist rivalry transforms itself into an inter-imperialist rivalry. There are different poles created, imperialist poles, the, you know, the ascendant German pole, desperate to have a greater footprint in the world, the British pole, which saw itself as the center and so on. So Lenin then, looking at that reality, says that the inter-imperialist rivalry from intercapitalist to imper has led to the Great War. It's a brilliant text. That's what he explains. Now, after, so that Great War never really ends. In my opinion, Europe has won long war from 1914 to 1945. You know, there's a break in this, like a half time. You know, uh, people went for snacks and then they came back to the fighting because really there's a thread that runs through from 1914 to 45. So after 1945, with the defeat of Germany and Italy, comprehensive defeat of, of the Axis powers um, and the ascendancy of the United States, which saw its, <laughs> saw, saw its landmass unaffected, unimpacted by the warfare, right? I mean, you know, there wasn't really an attack on, on the mainland of the United States, Pearl Harbor, but of the naval base. So when you look at um, the United States entering the European sector and also the Eastern sector, Japan, <laughs> the United States subordinates all of the European powers under its yoke. So you then have NATO as an instrument of, <laughs> sorry, of subordination. The world is then divided into two blocks. The socialist bloc, the capitalist bloc or the, the you know first world, and then the emergence of a third world, the developing countries. This is the geography, you know. Um, there is no inter-imperialist rivalry in that period. And there are some differences between the United States, Germany, and so on that appear in the ninth, sorry. <laughs> a terrible, terrible cough. It's just not going anywhere. Um, so the world is divided into these two blocks, the West and the East, as it were, with the developing world as a kind of group in formation. But there really isn't an inter-imperialist rivalry. You know, we have to be quite theoretically specific. The, the Eastern bloc wasn't an imperialist pole contesting the West, you know. So in a sense... The inter-imperialist rivalry was muted. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in an interesting way, you have the emergence of a kind of aggressive, you know, what let's call it the, the nascent global north developing, where the global north basically saw itself as prima inter pares, the United States in the lead. You know, everybody has to subordinate themselves to the global north. That's the third period, you know. The first was this inter-imperialist rivalry 
that leads to the great long war. Second, the emergence of a socialist camp where there was a kind of muted rivalries, you know, the rivalries between the different powers of, of Europe and the United States and, and Japan were muted. Um, Japan, Germany, and Italy were basically colonized in this period, you know, for long periods. Um, and when the Soviet Union collapses, uh, at the same time, there are some new tensions. Japan has an economy that's booming. And the United States in the 1990s uses a lot of muscle to break Japan's uh, rise. So there, are, there is the, the Plaza Accord and the reverse Plaza Accord, where the U.S. forces Japan to um, to do currency manipulation to benefit the U.S. dollar against the yen. Um, you know, it was it's incredible what J Japan was forced to do. Then going into a long recession, Germany the same way. The German elites basically moved their money um, into Wall Street and they colonized the east of Germany. Um, you know, there these countries aren't as sovereign as they think they are. Uh, but from about 2008, 9, 10, that period, we're entering a fourth era. And that's the era where, for a whole host of complicated reasons, you have the emergence economically. And, and you know, this is a, a byproduct of globalization, unintended consequence of globalization. China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, they have booming economies. This is the contradictions of history. You know, the West thought, Let's globalize and then we'll dominate the world. Well, you globalize, but what you did was you sort of orphaned your industry in the Western heartlands and shifted it all to Asia and parts of Latin America and so on. And those economies began to industrialize and boom. And their boom is seen as a great threat uh, to the what is considered the eternal power of the global north. And the global north's hyper-imperialism is actually a response uh, to the emergence of uh, the center of gravity shifting to Asia, to some extent, Latin America, and so on. So if you periodize these things, you look at these four periods, then it's pretty clear that um, you can't just take Lenin from 100 years ago and apply it religiously now and say, well, Lenin said that inter-imperialist conflict is, is you know, de rigueur, uh, is important for the concept. Therefore, we must find Interimperialist conflict today. I am a out and out Leninist, uh, but I'm not a religious person. And I do not read Marx or Lenin or anybody in a religious way. I believe that my tradition of, of Marxism, in fact, of intelligence, uh, suggests that you build theories out of the facts. Don't um, build a theory out of somebody else's theory. You know, you've got to look at the facts, and the facts suggest, which is why, Fiona, it's a 186 page you know, document filled with facts, um, which we have theorized. It's not just an empirical study. We have a theory in there, but I, I'm, a, a, I'm not a religious person. So I think a lot of people on the left, particularly in the West, for two reasons, um, you know, have this, this sense that, oh, there's inter-imperialist conflict. One is a religious attitude towards the idea of imperialism. Got to find imperialist, inter-imperialist conflict. And the second is, there is a cultural issue here, which people should consider. There is a kind of um, sinophobia that plays a role. There's a Slavophobia that plays a role. You know, there's a kind of ugly way in which people talk about Russia. Um, you know, the sort of, they are, you know, backward peoples. I mean, this was an enduring attitude in Western Europe that the Russians are a backward people. Um, you know, the Chinese are a backward people. This is all there, you know, this sort of, I mean, I, I don't want to get too much into that, but you know that it's there in the atmosphere, the way people talk about Putin and Xi Jinping. They've never talked about U.S. presidents, with, except maybe Trump to a small extent, but they've never talked about George W. Bush even with the same kind of fear, you know, of, of like the dragon is going to eat you or the bear, you know, polar bear is going to eat you. Uh, but what about the American eagle plucking your eye out? What about that? I think this is a chauvinism that we've got, which which has really got to be challenged, um, really. I mean, this chauvinistic attitude towards the global self that is even in the left thinking, actually, in um, in some of the global north. But I think, Ileana, you've got to... I mean, well, next, I'm you? just going to be a little bit cheeky because uh, Vijay just said, I don't want to get too into that 
<laughs> now I'm going to ask a question that is specifically forcing you, well, you know, into that, which is basically this study does make the, it does pose as that one of the main foundations of colonialism and today's imperialism is racism. And I'm going to quote from it to say, um, we can only understand the ideology of the U.S. ruling class by recognizing the racialized character of its class structure. So actually, could you talk a little bit more about the role of racism in colonial, in colonialism and imperialism historically and how it is shaping U.S. foreign policy today? Yeah, I mean, one side of it is the structure of, of colonialism and racism you know, how the world economy is structured. Um, so for instance, there is the, um, you know, I think pretty straightforward assumption that certain parts of the world are good producers of raw materials and good markets for finished goods produced elsewhere. Um, you know, how dare they produce a, a cell phone? Or isn't it ridiculous that they might produce a car? You know, there, there's a ridiculous that Bolivia producing an electric car, ridiculous. You know, Bolivia is good to produce Lithium, Bolivia is good to produce copper, um, Bolivia is good to produce tin, and it's good to buy our cars, but Bolivia can't produce a car. I mean, there is that attitude which is structured by the, um, the material basis of the global economy. In other words, that attitude also follows how the economy is structured. You know, who's ever heard of a Bolivian car being driven down the road in London? Um, you know, if I ask you, it was firstly astounding that Japanese cars, when Japanese cars came into the Western market, the racism that accompanied them, you know, um, there was a, a, a man, a Chinese American man by the name of Vincent Chin, who was beaten to death with baseball bats in Detroit in the 1980s. Um, and, you know, what, what was interesting is there's a good film I watched, a documentary called Who Killed Vincent Chin? And he was mistaken for Japanese uh, by the races that beat him. But what was interesting about the film, it showed how on television, um, you know, there were there were these demonstrations where they take a Japanese car and men would come with baseball bats and smash the car up. And that's exactly how Winston Chin was killed. Um, you know, how dare the Japanese export their cars? German car, understandable. Um, I'm not going to say anything about British cars, okay? But... German cars, understandable. Um, US cars, understandable. Japanese cars, out of the question. And by the way, South Korea flew under the radar here because you know because of the racism, most people assumed, well, those are Japanese cars, Subaru, you know, um, and so on. Okay, so that's one side of the structure of racism, you know, structured into the nature of the global economy and then into expectations of geographies of commodities. You know, certain things should come from certain places. Um, what, what the hell is a Belgian chocolate? You know, have you ever thought about that? I mean, what is a Belgian chocolate? What's a Swiss chocolate? Neither Belgium nor Switzerland produce cocoa. So what the hell, man? They don't even produce sugar. What are the key ingredients of chocolate? Sugar and chocolate, right? Milk, okay. But it's milk is the liquid in there. Sugar and cocoa. None of them are produced in Belgium or in um, in Switzerland. You know what is Belgian chocolate? When the Belgians stir ingredients that come from elsewhere. The stirring makes it Belgian. That's ridiculous. But that's the idea. You know, if I tried to sell you, if I said, hey, listen, Ilana, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to market um, Ghanaian chocolates. People would be like, no, it's Ghanaian cocoa and Belgian chocolates. There's a geography. Uh, world economy is structured as a geography of consumerism. There's a geography of expectation. You know, you, you, you can't imagine uh, these things. So the idea, for instance, of a Chinese smartphone is an abomination. You know, uh, even though Apple phones are all made in China, they're an, it's an Apple phone. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, from, it's a white phone. But to have a Huawei phone is just bizarre. It's an abomination. You understand? That's the first thing about that, right? This sort of like ah, the repulsion. But it, it's structured into the global economy. That's the one side. Secondly, look, racism like patriarchy and, and homophobia and so on, it just doesn't get turned off uh, by legislation or by a speech. Okay, You can't just legislate against these things and expect the world to change. Uh, there are hideous, deep, 
cultural antipathies built over time. You know, racism is so deeply structured into um, attitudes, um, you know, habits, routines, uh, casual things that children hear at home and so on. It's going to take a very long time to undo them. So for people to believe that the ruling classes uh, are not impacted by their own history, United States, where slavery was within living memory almost, you know, um, Jim Crow, certainly within living memory. Um, you know, the founding fathers of the United States owned slaves. I mean, you know, obviously this is an impact on on the, the imagination of the ruling class. You know, in, in the UK, I mean, um, this stuff about Diane Abbott, you know, uh, the way in which I'm not talking about what that donor said. OK, because that's a, some guy you can dismiss that. But the reaction to it demonstrates the ruling class's inability to take even one step outside um, its habitual racism. You know, the very fact that uh, Mr. Rishi Sunak says, well, I'm, I have the most diverse cabinet. That's a joke, man. That's like when people were accused of anti-Semitism and they said, no, I have a Jewish friend. Um, that is not exculpation for your behavior. You know, um, I mean, and in the case of Diane Abbott, you know, there's violence against women involved in that which is completely papered over. So all they talked about was, well, we have a diverse cabinet. How is your having a diverse cabinet uh, going to help, you know, routine, uh, normal violence against women, you know, and in this case against a black woman, but just the normalized violence that somehow was left out of the discussion. All of that shows that cultures can't be easily overcome. And it's sort of silly for Western countries and their leaders to after, say, the Holocaust, pretend that now everything is OK. I mean, Germany is saturated with the history of anti-Semitism. The soil of Germany has within it this history. So it's sort of ridiculous. And that's why their brain dead reflex uh, is to say we stand with Israel, because it's a way of kind of burying over the actual ugliness of the soil of, an of anti-Semitism upon which they walk and on which they live. So. This thing about saying, well, you know, the class, it's, it actually refers not just to, you know, the, the income distribution by race or, or you know, the, the lack of parity in payment between men and women and so on. It's actually about the psychosocial construction of attitudes as much as it is the structure of, of the economy. These things go hand in hand. And, you know, thank God I'm a Marxist um, because I can see how these things relate. In other words, the material conditions of life relate to the consciousness of people. But the consciousness sometimes gets so deeply embedded that it, in fact, uh, even if the material base starts to change, the consciousness has its own life and it's very difficult to rip out. You know, um, you can have a situation where, let's say, women and men get the same salaries, right? Uh, but you will see patriarchy will will assert itself in different ways that, you know, we've got to attend to this. And in, in the global North countries, the, the reflex racism, you know, is so intense. Um, the fact that, that um, you know, uh, politicians can be so crude, Western politicians in, in trying to discipline elected officials of countries that are 10 times the size of your own country, you know, um, I mean, there's a grotesqueness in this, in, in the kind of license to be rude. You know, uh, it's it's ridiculous. Like, like for instance, how easily people say, say Xi Jinping is a dictator or Putin is a dictator. Uh, I mean, it's hardly a great way to have a conversation. You know, if I'm a, a, a leader of a country, I don't want to say that about somebody else if I need to negotiate with them. You know, I need to I need to have a much different public posture. I need to put my hand out and shake hands with them. This reflexive, you know, um, thing that, oh, that's, that person is a dictator. Um, but meanwhile, you're pretty happy to, to talk to, you know, monarchs. Uh, what, what's that? You know, it, it, calm down. You know, in, in England, you know, every parliamentarian has to go and swear an oath to the king. Um, that's somehow quite acceptable. You know, you do that. But, but an elected official in another country you don't like is the authoritarian. But hello, monarchies are authoritarian by definition. Because you're happy with that, but you're not happy with the elected official you don't like because you're not sure about 
their election. You know, you're not sure about the the you know the vitality of their democratic society. Of course, your society super democratic, not really, but you think so, yeah. I mean, you really think so. I mean, the fact that you know these these donors give millions of, of pounds uh, for an election campaign doesn't itself stop people to ask what's happening with our democracy bought and paid for by some nutcase who says such offensive things you know and then the ruling party doesn't return the money after it's revealed i mean fascinating this way in which race and and superiority you know what they call white supremacy but it's basically a forms of superiority along different axes so easy to just make normal and say the other people they are the ones who are crazy absolutely and i mean in this kind of context where you have these reactionary ideas in the global north that i think it's getting worse i think we're seeing an increase in in racism and sexism and homophobia that's kind of the trend definitely within britain but then when you when you look internationally there are quite a lot of tremendously progressive things happening and i think one of the the kind of things which um is is in the hyperimperialism document really centrally is how that we have the relative economic decline of the United States and the global north in general compared to the global south and China. And this is um, leading the United States to have to rely more and more on its military power, which, as you've explained, um, the US maintains global dominance on that. And um, one of the, the facts I wanted to just um, highlight is the fact that China, which in the, in the dossier is defined as a socialist country, um, has now overtaken the United States, well, actually overtook the United States in 2016 in terms of its economic size in uh, purchasing parity, power parity, PPP terms. So now that China's the biggest economy in the world, so I just wanted just for you to reflect on, BJ, like what is the significance of this change in the world and what are the consequences of it? I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because it is true that China has had a breakthrough. Um, you know, when I was... Um, you know, maybe 20 years ago or something, I, I was very much uh, influenced by dependency theory. The idea that um, underdevelopment is is produced, you know, by the structure of the global economy. And there was a kind of pessimism in dependency theory. How does a country break out uh, from this cycle of dependency, you know? And then um, in the 1980s, during the debt crisis, this big third world debt crisis, so many countries, Mexico first in 1982 and so on, went to the international capital markets and said, we just can't honor our obligations. They went bankrupt. Uh, many, many countries. This is known as the third world debt crisis. When that occurred, it seemed like, oh man, the game is over. You know, uh, the, We are basically seeing a recolonization of the world. My friend Chakravati Raghavan, wrote a book called Recolonization in this period, um, talking about how the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and so on are, are instruments of this recolonization. And then in the late 1980s, um, a group of third world leaders uh, impaneled with the UN's help, the South Commission, where they had discussions around the world, important economists, political leaders. It was led by um, you know Julius Nyerere of formerly the president of Tanzania. Um, and they came up with a, a very good report, uh, you know, the challenge of the South. In the report, which, you know, I was one of the few people to go and read all of their documents, which was sitting in a bomb shelter um, in Geneva, Switzerland. And I'm told that much of that archive has now been destroyed, but I read everything in there, spent days uh, in this bomb shelter. Um, and what they discussed in the South Commission was the necessity of allowing the so-called locomotives of the South some freedom to grow by themselves. And eventually these locomotives would pull the rest of the South along. Um, it's a very interesting theory that they articulated it. It appears in their book, Challenge of the South, but it's actually clearer in their internal conversations in this, this group. It's a very significant group. It had high officials from China, high officials from Cuba, you know, uh, the next, the Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was the Secretary General of that body. And then he leaves Geneva and becomes India's Finance Minister. These are all people of some importance in, in the third world. Okay. You see then uh, that globalization takes off in the 1990s. And as I said earlier, um, the World Trade Organization is set up when the Western countries believe 
hey, listen, as long as we control intellectual property, we can effectively deterritorialize production. We can have production take place in many places, doesn't have to be inside our countries, as long as we control intellectual property. And here, something happened which they didn't foresee. Um, it was very clear that as a consequence of the socialist um, you know, process in China, that Chinese workers were some of the best educated and healthiest workers in the world because of the socialist advances. You know, in India, for instance, it was poor health care, bad nutrition, terrible sewage, bad water quality. Workers are getting sick all the time. You know, they are underfed, malnutrition, the education levels are not great, literacy levels. So when you're going to have high-tech factories, it's very clear that you'd better position them in China than in India. Okay, China dominates the industrial uh, thing. And then China, because it was attractive, turned to companies and said, you can come in, we'll allow you to invest in our country, but you have to show us what you're doing. You have to share your intellectual property. And companies desperate to set up in China shared the IP. Big mistake. Big mistake. Because then Chinese companies started to produce the same thing, sometimes better. For instance, um, in green technology, solar cells and so on, much better. These French companies tried to sue the Chinese in the World Trade Organization. And the Chinese said, hey, look at this. You signed over on a piece of paper saying we could, you know, we could get access to your IP. And then we made the IP better because we've invested in science uh, and we've invested in technology and so on. This was a break between the dependency contradiction. You know, whereas we thought, oh, there's no way to get out of this cycle of dependency. Um, in the 1990s and 2000s, there was a breakthrough. Even India, even Indonesia, um, for different reasons, some of it they used high commodity prices to their advantage, had a breakthrough. Brazil, to a lesser extent. Um, you know, Nigeria, lesser extent. But it was not just China. China was ahead of all the other countries, but a number of these countries had economic breakthroughs. Uh, I, I hesitate to say India because I was very opposed to the liberalization in 1991, but it had contradictory impacts. Certainly half a million Indian peasants and farmers committed suicide as a consequence of the opening up. But on the other hand, uh, there was a kind of economic heating that took place. Now, it's not the same as China because it's not balanced growth. Um, it's not actually all industrial growth. A lot of it is cannibalistic. But still, the center of gravity does shift in this period. Thanks to the contradictions of, of, of globalization and China's socialist direction, because that did produce enormous advantages over countries like India and so on. So that actually provides the biggest threat to the West. You can't do anything about this. You can try to delegitimize Chinese companies. The attempt to delegitimize Huawei uh, was is a big part of this. That didn't work very well. You know, you, you travel, let's say I was recently in Ghana, went to the market briefly to get a, a battery uh, that I needed, a charger. Um, you look at the phone shops. It's basically either Chinese phones or knockoff phones or South Korean phones. Nobody sells iPhones in the markets of Ghana. You, you can buy an iPhone, but it's for a different class of people. Uh, it's too expensive, you know? So they tried to delegitimize it by saying, well, they're snooping on you and nobody cares. Like you think in Accra, Ghana, somebody cares about that. Oh, in the Huawei phone, they're going to snoop on me. They know Google is the biggest snoop of them all. And 80% of us in the world use Google, you know, the Chrome browser. 80% um, of the world's population that's on the internet uses the Chrome browser. The biggest snoops in the world. Eric Schmidt said so in his own book. He said that, you know, we work closely with the US military. Why are you worried about your phone? On the phone, whatever phone you have, you open the Chrome browser and you're just saying, hello, CIA, you know, so it's ridiculous. So that Those contradictions have produced the emergence of not only China, but a group of countries. And this is a big threat to the West or the global North. You mentioned earlier about the new moods. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? And also, to what extent can the new mood 
can can the new mood actually be sustained in the context of hyperimperialism? Almost every week, I have a new example of the new mood. Um, you know, one day it's the Namibian prime minister, next day it's the Namibian president, then it's the Indian foreign minister. You know, you, you can just add it up. I mean, the, the South African foreign minister is a gift that keeps on giving. I mean, she is so brave, so bold, so clear about the genocide taking place in Gaza, and she just speaks right to the powerful countries in their face. She doesn't care. In the presence of U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, she said that we don't want to be bullied. I mean, my God, you know, in the United States, the word bullying is a serious word because this is a crisis in schools. And then to turn to the highest foreign minister of the U.S., the Secretary of State, and say, we don't take kindly to being bullied. Wow. You know, strong words from Naledi Pandor. Recently, Anwar Ibrahim of Malaysia, that's the example of this week, uh, basically, you know, disrespected correctly um, the chancellor of Germany, Olaf Schulz, by saying, you know, you don't understand anything about genocide and you don't know what the Palestinians are enduring. You know, you're a boring, boring guy who has no legitimacy even in his own country. Didn't exactly say that, but that was the undertone. That's the new mood, because even three, four years ago, we would never have seen a Malaysian head of government or a South African talk with such lack of, um, you know, bowing and scraping, such lack of civility uh, to the Global North leaders. That's the new move. And that's not just from these high officials. That's their polling data. People just don't respect the um, leadership of the countries of the West. I mean, United States is basically... You know, it's an own goal territory. Uh, they have an election between Biden and Trump. That's an own goal. Like, I don't even have to kick the ball. You know, I don't even have to go on the field. You're putting the ball and constantly kicking it into your own goal. I'm not even there on the field. You're doing it to yourself. Um, that is a fatal blow. Now, will this actually become something? I'm not actually convinced about that. I I'm Pretty happy to say there's a new mood, okay? And I want to leave it at that. Where this will go is an act of praxis. In other words, it depends on whether a new theory emerges of how should the global South position itself. Um, and, and I have doubts about that. And secondly, it has to do with um, the ability to create institutions that anchor that theory. You know, um, will that, that happen? I have doubts about that. And I, I'm not an enormous believer in the concept of multipolarity. I, I think it's, a, it's really just a phrase. It's not anchored in a theory. But nonetheless, I think the use of this term, even in the high capitals of the South, uh, the use of this term multipolarity suggests that the countries don't want to create a block. Um, they don't want to actually act upon that mood in a concerted way. The Chinese, for instance, very loath to create um, you know, a global South project. You got the BRICS, but the BRICS is a very timid organization. You know, it's not aggressive. Um, it's not contesting the United States or the global North. They don't want that. They keep talking about collaboration and so on. And I think actually, I agree with that tonality. You know, I think the new mood is extraordinary, but it should not be accelerated because I think we don't want any clash that leads to, you know, military conflict and so on. What we want is a dialing down of tension. And the new mood is trying to put these leaders in their place. And in fact, what I would say is rather than the South come up with a coherent Southern project, you know, that unites everybody in a frontal confrontation with the global North, I hope this new mood, um, you know, encourages within the global North, within the people of the global North, pressure on their own leaders to dial it back. Um, you know, I think more important than the South coming up with a head to head confrontation with the North is for the peoples of the North to say, hey, listen, you know, we've now realized that, in fact, we are not special. You know, we are merely countries in the planet Earth and we need to treat other countries with dignity. I think it's wrong that we have this lecturing posture. And I, I actually see this mood developing in the North the protests around Palestine and the delegitimization of leadership and so on. I mean, look at the UK. You'll go into an election. I mean, you think Biden versus Trump is funny in the US, but why is 
um, Sunak versus Starmer any less hilarious? You know, um, there's an e equal ridiculousness there. And, you know, I, I was, you know, whatever one must say about these things, I think there are also interesting uh, indicators that the British public is not, you know, is equal to the task of moving elsewhere. The election in Rochdale, a good example of the British public basically not that keen on being suffocated between Starmerism and, and Sunakism, you know, looking for something else. Um, you know, I, I would be really interested. It, it could be an interesting exercise if the Scottish National Party decides to run candidates in London. Um, that could be an interesting exercise in itself. Because after all, the SNP, unlike Sinn Féin, takes their seats in Westminster. Um, and in a sense, therefore, they have a claim on London. You know, I understand Scottish nationalism, but they should, as a as a political exercise, run one or two candidates in London. I think it would be hilarious if the SNP ran a candidate against Starmer um, in his constituency in London. That would be quite, quite an interesting scene. So these are the contradictions coming out of the South which I hope will impact the peoples of the North. And I, I, I would be very much uh, cautious for anyone to assume that the countries of the South should coalesce into a bloc for a full frontal confrontation. I think that's adventurous, that's dangerous, um, that's not what we want. And, and I, I can see small sections of the left in the North Atlantic world, um, you know, disappointed. Why isn't China leading a direct confrontation against the West? I think that's a very adventurous desire. And I'm I'm in a way glad that people are pretty sober. Now, I'm disappointed that countries of the South aren't giving more material support to the Cubans, to the Palestinians, and so on. Very disappointed. I think they could do much more than they are doing. But still, that's different from a full frontal confrontation. Very dangerous. Well, well on this topic of a full frontal confrontation, I mean... We're obviously here in Britain, in London, uh, myself, and we're trying to build up an anti-war movement. And the stakes are getting higher and higher, it seems, because I just want to quote um, a recent statement from our Defence Secretary, or I say our, not, not my Defence Secretary, Grant Shouts, but the British uh, Defence Secretary. And he said in a really, in a keynote speech, but let's be clear, this comes from the lines of Washington. This is really what Washington's thinking in terms of foreign policy is. The following, the era of the peace dividend is over. In five years time, we could be looking at multiple theatres of war involving Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. So that's coming from our Defence Secretary in Britain. So could you maybe give us some um, ideas about how we can build and strengthen an effective anti-war movement, which is capable of opposing this US-led war drive? So, I mean, a few things, Fiona. Firstly, I mean, you know best because um, this is a movement you will build. But... A couple of thoughts, just observations. I, I don't presume to have more than that. One is that um, I think it's a pretty good thing to reflect on the fact that um, for a very long time, the Western or the Global North military bloc has not really won any wars. Um, it, it has destroyed countries. You know, um, the statement that uh, I often use is the US is really good at blowing up bridges, terrible at building them. Um, and so... That's the first thing, you know, it's it's arrogant to say, well, we're gonna be in all these wars, for what, to what end? You haven't won any wars. If you can't defeat, subordinate the Taliban in Afghanistan, how are you gonna beat the North Koreans who have nuclear weapons and missiles and so on? How are you gonna defeat the Chinese, 1.4 billion people? Are you crazy? I mean, there's an element of Dr. Strangelove in those kind of comments, you know? So it's not practical, that's the first thing. Practically, you haven't won any wars, so stop talking about winning wars. That's just a practical problem in your statement. Secondly, I don't think they actually mean to conduct all these wars. I think this is part of the arrogance. This is intimidation. This is, you know, machoistic statecraft. And I think we need to depart from that. I think it's important in the peace movement um, to depart from this, to, to criticize it on those terms that, you know, this is a kind of language we don't want anymore. In our, it doesn't keep us safer. How does, you know, how is like damaging the lives of thousands of young uh, British soldiers, uh, keeping security in Britain, you know, how how is that help? You know, what, what logic, what world does that help you in? Like what 
Where is the Chinese threat against Britain? You, you want to know the threat against Britain? Maybe you should look at the city of London. Um, look at the bondholders, how they're screwing the country. You know, um, I mean, I was struck by, I watched George Galloway's maiden speech in, in the Commons. I was struck by what he said about 50% of the children in poverty. There's no place to be born in Rochdale. I was struck by all those that, that stuff, you know. I've never been to that part of the UK, never been to Manchester, that side. Um, I don't know what these towns look like, to be honest with you. I mean, I have a very poor understanding of, of, of the Midlands uh, in general. But this collapse that he was describing, that's serious. That's your security problem. You know, you don't have a security problem from the Chinese. You have a security problem from capitalism. You've got to deal with that. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like the first point I made is the point I mostly want to sit on, which is that stop talking about wars. You don't know how to win them. Um, you know how to destroy countries, but that's not the same thing. You know, um, you can you can turn Yemen into rubble, but nobody has won that war in Yemen. You know, the Yemenis are still standing. Um, Ansar Allah, which is in power in, in Sana'a, is not going to be cowered by half a dozen cruise missiles. You know, they got hit harder by the Saudis, uh, heavily armed by BAE systems and the UK government. Um, that didn't, they didn't flinch. They fought back. So you can't win a war, guys. The Israelis are not able to win the war in Gaza. You know, they are destroying Gaza. They are conducting a genocide. They can't win the war. Um, you know, they had entered Gaza in the second phase. First phase was bombing. Phase two, as declared by the war ministry in Israel, was the entry of troops into northern Gaza. Phase three was the withdrawal of those troops because they were getting attacked and there were too many soldiers being killed. So even in even in Gaza, where there is a plausible genocide going on, even in Gaza, where the West uh, has been backing the Israelis, they can't win that war. Um, you can destroy countries. You can't win wars. So that kind of language is arrogant. It's out of touch. It's tone deaf and it's dangerous, but it's not accurate. So do you have any recommendations for people to read to inform or inspire us? <laughs> well, I have just finished reading a very fine book by Anthony Lowenstein called The Palestine Laboratory, which is how the Israeli government um, using German reparation funds built its military industry, how it has tested, quote unquote, its military weaponry against the Palestinian people, and then how it has sold those weapons to countries around the world, including surveillance technologies like Pegasus and so on, all tested against the Palestinians, live testing. You know, we don't allow medical live testing like this, but military live testing is routine. It's a terrific book by an Australian um, a journalist, Anthony Lowenstein, called The Palestine Laboratory from Verso Books. I really recommend it. Well, everyone listening or watching, please add that to your um, reading list, but also make sure you're following the work of Vijay Prashad if you're not already, and all the fantastic work at um, Tricontinental, including the hyper-imperialism study, which I think, what did you say, is 180 pages. If you haven't quite got the, the, the time to read that, which you definitely should, but if you haven't quite got the time to read that, then there is an executive summary which you can find on the, on the website, and that's you know very well worth delving into as well. Eliana, over so to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, PJ. It was wonderful to have you. Um, and uh, did you already say like and subscribe? You know, you did, didn't you? Oh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Sorry. No. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. One job. To... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's down there too. That's what you do. You do this. You yeah, you click on that. And then yeah, please, Thank yeah, you. please <laughs> like, subscribe, leave a comment, and um spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, PJ. It's been great having you with us. Hey, thanks a lot. And, you know, it's important people follow all the no Cold War uh, social media, all of them. Yeah, do that. <laughs> Thank God we have a professional here to to really, you know, to say that properly. Thank you, Vijay. <laughs>